This will be the longest 20 minutes in my life. Let me start right here. I decided in, in this UIA to start all my presentations with this one, that we have the same clients all over the place. We have the same DNA. We are a walking creature. We have the same senses. We have the same uh, movements. Everything is the same in the basics. We are walking animal. And we like other people very much around the world. Um, I, I'm talking a little bit about city planning, and we will go very fast. We have the good old days where all cities in all parts of the world looked like this because they were built by the client for the client, by the homo sapiens for people, human scale, they were all same dimensions and it's very interesting to see all these similarities. But the good old days, they ended very abruptly. They ended exactly in 1933. And that was not because Hitler took over in Germany, that was because we had the CIM Charter of City Planning say that we forget everything of the past, now we have a new creature, not Homo sapiens, we have modern man, everything old is redundant, we, everything shall be separate, uh, new, and we shall from now on always separate work, um, work, living and recreation and communication, always separate. Before, in the good old days, all the settlements and cities were built around spaces. The whole life of a city was, was organized in spaces where there, we did everything in spaces. Cities were spaces. And all this, so focus was on spaces. This ended abruptly in 1933 that they decided that from now on the focus should be on the objects. And what was not built upon was not spaces for life and people, that was leftover space. And here we have this new era, objects. In the old days, and you can look at the old part of Copenhagen, you can remember all the streets and all the squares and only three buildings. That's the Royal Castle, and that's the cathedral, and that may be the parliament or the town hall. All the other buildings are more or less anonymous. They are forming the spaces which are forming the cities. So cities were spaces for life and people. We have the famous Nolly map of Rome uh, from 748. And again, you can see that when he is to describe Rome, it's all spaces. Some are inner, inside buildings, but they are public, and other are outside. City spaces. In a modern city, I wouldn't call this a city because this collection of funny objects, but it could be Dubai. Um, but we remember no spaces because there are no spaces. We remember funny buildings because now we have the focus on objects and the architects, they compete in making funny objects and it looks like the perfume bottles in the, my wife's corner in the bathroom. They all contain the same, but what is different is the shape. By spreading the buildings, the modernists aimed at more healthy living conditions. But there's more to health than fresh air. There is a social dimension in architecture and city planning which they completely overlooked. So the whole world started to look like this. And in my, in my view, what was happening with the modernists was a goodbye to the concern for people and social life, which has been throughout the history of man's settlements. And also it was a goodbye to the feeling, to the understanding of human scale, because now instead of making spaces, we made buildings, and what was not built was leftover space, and people were drifting around in the leftover space, which was always far too wide and far too big and far too windy and whatever. So it was a farewell to a number of things which were part of human life until 1933. Did we like this modernism? There are many, many evidence that we never really came to love that kind of settlements. Another thing which really has changed city planning has been the car invasion. Cars, and again with modernism, 
It started in 1933, but only after the war, around 1960, did it unfold really with Brasilia and whatever. And it, it ran then uh, until 1998, but I'll tell you about that shortly. But the other big thing which really also happened in the big scale from 1960 was a car inv invasion. The car came in and they took over everything. All over the world with the people, if they were in the old spaces of the old cities, they were pushed out. And in the new cities, the only thing which they thought about was making the cars happy. And it was bad in, in the existing cities and in the developed world, and it was much worse in all the developing countries where people just were trying to survive with the car invasion. Here is a summary of the car invasion. Um, in all these spaces which we used to have, it ended up by a little shelf on the cliff and a big void where you have a little hanging bridge which you can sometimes pass over. If we go to back to 1960 and ask the question, what really did we know about quality for people in relation to city planning and architecture at that point? The answer is we knew virtually nothing. What we had known was thrown out by the modernists in the moment of the modern movement. They said everything old is redundant. Don't look at it. Don't learn from it. Because we, for many centuries, we've given good ideas from one generation to the next, and that created the good old days and all the settlements we had with spaces. Then came, of course, very naturally, there came a counter movement, and the first voice was Jane Jacobs um, with her famous work in New York. You know all about it, so I will not tell much, but he said, if the modernists and the motorists are going to form our cities, it will not be great cities, it will be dead cities. She is a very big figure in urban design and humanistic city planning, and I saw this in Toronto a couple of years ago, and you know, Jesus looks after the past, but the future is run by Jane Jacobs still. <laughs> you cannot get greater. The story of my life um, I, it's a very short story, even if I have 63 years of practice as an architect, it will be a very compressed story. I was graduated in the 60s, and what did they do in the 60s in School of Architecture? They instructed you to do modernism. And we were, all, all, all the time, five years, we spent moving objects around um, <laughs> in interesting patterns. <laughs> and... Uh, then, then we were educated, and this professor was very famous. He's a Swedish man, I'll not mention his name. But he was famous for saying that a good housing area is something which looks good from the freeway. And here he has succeeded <laughs> in making some housing area in Sweden which looks pretty well from the, from the freeway. But I think that there's a very important thing here that we were told in School of Architecture in the 50s that it didn't matter how you put the buildings because people would be so happy of getting a, a new flat and a new house and running water and a water closet that they will be happy ever after. It didn't matter how you put the buildings. So what really matters was architecture. It should be a nice pattern. So we make nice pattern. Seen from an aeroplane. And the other thing was aesthetics was very important. So architecture was, that was really the thing to do from an architect, make aesthetics. And, and it doesn't matter with all the rest of it. That uh, <coughs> I was, <coughs> it was six, 1960, I graduated. Just after that, I married a psychologist. And <laughs> then my, my, uh, the, my group of friends changed and there was a lot of, of young social scientists, social studied students in our house, sociologists, psychologists, and we, argued, we young architects in the early days of the extreme modernism, we had a bad time because they were after us all the time. Why don't you take an interest? Why, don't you, why are you not interested in people? Why don't they teach you anything about people in school of architecture? Why do you think your, your professors go out four o'clock in the morning to take photos of the objects 
so that they have no disturbing people in the foreground on the photos. Why do you think that? And we will say, it doesn't matter what you build, and they'll say, oh my dear, you know this much. And then, of course, we realized that there was this enormous gap between architecture and technical sciences and social sciences. Nothing was known how form and life influenced each other. It was in the old days tradition, but after modernism, no knowledge. In my case, um, I think I shall back if I can. Yeah, I had then to go back to School of Architecture for 40 more years. And so first I, I asked them, why didn't you tell me about people when I were here first time? And they said, uh, then it appeared that they knew nothing. So that's why they did. And then we realized we had to start from square one to find out about how the built form influenced the life of people. And I just, I sat on my back, on my behind for 40 years and, and looked and looked and looked and, and got studies and systematized, whatever. I'll show you two little examples of some of these studies of which there were endlessly many from Greenland to Melbourne to um, Japan, whatever. Okay, what is this? School of Architecture moved from a central position in Copenhagen out to the harbor. We got a Navy barrack, and they called in a very famous landscape architect, and they said, do some landscaping. He did some wonderful landscaping. He did some wonderful lawns with corrugated iron around them, as you shall do as a good landscape architect. And what is this in the corner here? That is the corner of the School of Architecture. So the, the students come around here to that point, and then they can see where they can have coffee. That's in the canteen over there. And what does a student do when he can see when he has coffee? Of course, the landscape architect would say, he will go in right angles. <laughs> but that's not the students I know. They went straight for the coffee, and then <laughs> after just two weeks, the landscape architect had to come out and finish his project. He could have known from day one that, of course, oh yes, not to worry. Here's another little study that's about the edge effect. If people are to spend time in the space, we go out to the edge. That's very logical because all our senses are in front of us, and by standing at the edge, we have control of everything. Nobody can sneak up from behind, and we are not conspicuous. If you stand here for a long time, people will start to say, what's he doing over there? Why is he standing there? That's a bit suspicious. He's been there now for 10 minutes, for God. Maybe we shall call the police. That's very... <laughs> so we go over to the edge. We all go over to the edge. We go edge over to the edge in St. Peter's Square in Rome and everywhere. If we are to spend some time, we love to be at the edge. Then we came to think, maybe architects are different. And then we started to study how architects behave. And this is for architecture schools. And we found to our great surprise that architects behave like other people. They have, <laughs> they have the same senses and they love to be out at the edge and see what's going on. And then the next question was, who on earth put up these benches? <laughs> And who did they think would come and sit there if they were not forced to sit there? And can I give you a bit of advice? That is, that if you do things like that, make sure to get some bronze people to be there, or they will never be used, because that's against everything. So all these, all these endless many studies, which we picked up over the years, myself it started early, and some other staff ever joined and the students joined and we have traveled, I've uh, been in Melbourne for a long time and we, I've been in, uh, all over the place and done studies and found that there's a great similarity of behavior in all parts of the world because we are all inhabited by the same client. What happens if you do research and put it down in books? I have done, I think, seven books and they are out in 41 languages, which is not because they're very good, but because I was one of the first who started to describe how life and form was uh, influencing each other. And by doing so, 
I realized because I'm very old that then what you can do is you can change the way people think. You can change the mindset. And that I realize is what you can do through research and books. And also I realized that this is the most important part of my life that is changing the mindset, bringing out information so we can do better projects and take more care of the people. Uh, I've, only 16 years later, the book came out in English. That was pretty fast. <laughs> uh, and I'm very, very proud, very proud that all my books are published now in Chinese. Actually, they are very quick. They publish them right away. They have all six of them. Unfortunately, they have not had time to read them, although. <laughs> but, uh, it may be when the mindset sort of seeps through that they will be more subtle in their handling of the people. Um, we knew nothing in 1960, and we had to sit on our behind, and now it's 50, 60 years ago, and we know actually quite a bit. We, I would say there's not much written about all this, but there's enough so that we know how to make good cities, fine cities for people we know now. The problem now really is to make sure that it is used. You've been out in, in uh, yeah, we can refer to this very briefly. You've been out in, in this new town of from Copenhagen called Ørsted, which where they have really not read any of the books <laughs> uh, in doing that project. Uh, we'll return to that maybe. We, what, what, what we did we learn through this research? We learned really that we form the cities, but then the cities form our life and our lifestyles and, and the way we meet other people, whatever. We form the buildings and the residential areas, and then the residential situation forms our life. We can have a rich life with the neighbors and the kids can have many friends, or you can live in a, in a mountain where it's hardly possible to get out. We also know that you can make squares or spaces where, which are so devoid of quality that the only thing people think about when they are in these squares, that is to get away as fast as you can. So they run out at maximum speed. We have out in Ørsted and right near to Bella Center a place where out of 12 quality criteria, they overlook 13. And the only thing people do there is to run as fast as they can. We can also make spaces which have a lot of policies so that people can hardly get through them without being tempted to sit or to enjoy or to stop and see what's going on and being places which becomes destination so people come from all over the city to meet their friends in that space. That is the other extreme. We can do this or we can do that. And if you do this and that, that's a fantastic difference. We have followed a number of squares and found that you can have 10 times more activity with the same number of, of citizens if you do all the things right as opposed to do all the things wrong. We have an enormous influence. It, it matters how you put the things, I can assure you. Um, <clears throat> then, good news. In 1998, all the city planners from Europe met once again in Athens to make the second charter of city planning. And the second charter of city planning said, never, never, never separate residents, recreation, workplace, and communication. Always keep people together. So modernism lasted 65 years. Actually, it took 65 years really to realize the shortcomings of this modernistic philosophy. And still there are quite a few places, Ørsted being one of them, where they didn't get the message in time to, to stop being modernist and start to make cities for people. Later, new towns in Copenhagen and all places in Denmark have done better than Ørsted, I'm proud to say. I'm so ashamed of the way you have to go from the metro over to Belly Center. It's a disgrace for architecture and for the UIA to be in such a place. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> 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 
By changing the mindset, then you have the background for changing architecture. In my case, it's about changing cities. You should know what you should go for, and then you could go and and what actually happened the other way, we did all the mindset thing, and then the mayors came and talked to the sleeves and say, you can criticize, but couldn't you please come and tell us what we shall do? This, of course, the first thing, the first place where we worked, that was really Copenhagen. And I think that Copenhagen is very much influenced by the mindset I talked about. Um, but I'll not talk about Copenhagen today. We talked about Copenhagen yesterday. I'll talk about some of the other cities, but because uh, shortly after we have started to publish what we did for Copenhagen, we were invited to Stockholm and we were invited to Oslo, and then we started in Australia, in Perth, and, um, and then came Melbourne, and the story of Melbourne we, we heard a little bit yesterday by Rob Adams, and I'm doing this especially because the city architect of Melbourne is here, and the city architect of Sydney is here, and probably there are some people from New York here also. So there will be a little bit about our work in this place, only a little bit, and that will be my story. Not Melbourne was, I was first in Melbourne in 1967, as a 66, as a visiting professor. It was a really awful place. They, they called it the, it was empty, useless city center, and they called it the donut. Something with nothing in the middle. It was, it was completely empty in the weekend and in the evenings. It was really an office city, really bad. But they in Melbourne decided to revitalize the city and some fabulous effort has gone into making Melbourne one of the most livable cities in the world ever since that time. And they, and when I say they, they, they we can specify that Maybe some specific person, I'll come back to that. But I think they've done a fantastic work in Melbourne. They said in Melbourne, we walk. If we are going to walk in the city, we need nice wide sidewalks. We need good quality, good furniture in the city. We need trees to shade. And no bloody shop is going to close the front, the front to, the, to my sidewalk. And they even had a saying that, when we put granite on or bluestone on all the sidewalks, you cannot go out to IKEA and buy a cafe chair for fifty dollars or five uh, twin dollars and put it in my. You have to have proper cafe chairs. They were really careful with the quality, and I think that over the years Melbourne has really become a fantastic city. I think it's like the atmosphere is like Paris, but the climate is quite a bit better. So. Um, um, they, they, they vitalized all the lanes and some people think that my and my company was involved in that we were not at all because we did nothing in Melbourne we delivered some mindset in Melbourne but the work was done by an individual called Rob Adams he's the one who he's a city architect and he's the one saying I had 16 mayors I've handled them all and <laughs> For 16 mayors' time, he has just moved Melbourne towards being a fantastic city. Um, of course, the Australian humor, I like that very much. Say no to the vibrant lanes, save our culture, whatever. Um, they are very humorous down there. Uh, also in Melbourne, they introduced the bicycles, and they, uh, they called it Copenhagen-style bicycle lanes. What is Copenhagen-style bicycle lanes? That is when you put the parked cars on the outside of the bicycles, so the parked cars protect the bicycles, instead of in other places where they have the bicycles to protect the car cars. <laughs> That's a fantastic difference. And in Melbourne, they do it all the time. Always the parked cars will protect the bicycles, except uh, one place. I think it must be the Archbishop's car or something, because suddenly they have another idea here. But Melbourne is doing very fine, and if I shall give you an advice, if you cannot find a place to live in Copenhagen, then move to Melbourne. That is a fantastic city on the southern hemisphere, time and again on the top list of most livable in the world, Melbourne. Then, after we worked in Melbourne and, and in London, London was very short-lived because Ken Livingstone 
was followed by Boris Johnson, and then we had nothing to do in London. Um, but they managed to go to New York and say they should get us as, as, as advisors for humanizing New York. That was a big sort of a task. Uh, the mayor said in 2007, I will make New York the most sustainable metropole in the world in no time to speak of. And then he, yeah, New York was not great at that point. Here is some uh, shots from the bicycle scene. They used the bicycles to protect the parked cars. And here are some <laughs> posters from the Bicycle Association about situation for bicycling in New York. Um, Mayor said these things and was doing these things, and then they came rushing over to Copenhagen to see what to do, because already at that time, Copenhagen had started to have a reputation as a place where you could get some ideas for humanizing your city. And they were here, they had bicycles, and we couldn't get the bicycles away from Jeanette Sadikan and Amanda Burden and the other guys, because they were so happy, and, and, and in the end, uh, after two days, we got the bicycle in the airport. And, and they left and say, we want a city like this one. When can you come? Then I was quick. I said, we come on Monday. And we <laughs> went there on Monday. Um, and then we did a lot of things uh, about uh, um, giving advice and making studies of the life. In, and everybody say you can never use European experience, European methods in the Big Apple and forget about it. And when they started to say, we wanted a, we wanted a, city, a, a street like Champs-Élysées, couldn't we use Broadway? And the traffic engineers say, Broadway, you must be crazy. Whole city will break down, it will not work. Then Mayor said, go and go and model it. And a year later, they came out absolutely red in the faces and said, well, Broadway is not necessary. So they were able to close Broadway, and that was when Times Square, Herald Square, Union Square, Madison Square was, Broadway was closed, and we were able to give all this traffic land to people activities, and at once we saw these transformations. Also in New York, they started in the big way making a bicycle plan. The mayor said, New York is flat, it's concentrated, the roads are big, we have room for bicycle lanes, and they started this big program of Copenhagen-style bike lanes in New York. They, yeah, that was a little thing. <laughs> then I started, I started to realize that when you do all these bad things to cities, there's a tendency that they give you awards and medals. So they came up and said, you, you have this one. Uh, so after having done all these very unpopular things, you get a hero. That's very interesting that architects sometimes can be in the role of a hero. In Sydney, Sydney, 2006 and onward. Fantastic waterfront and really bad city center. Um, and we were starting to work. It was very hard work. They had, though, a fantastic mayor, still have her five terms, terms she's done, and every time she has had the platform, I'll make city more people-friendly and more green. And they, she gets more and more votes. Fantastic mayor. It was very hard to work in Sydney because the bus, buses belong to the state of New South Wales and the street belongs to Sydney. They wanted to have the buses out and the state wanted to have them. They've been here for 60 years. They can stay for another decade. We pushed. It was hard. They were many years now, nothing was happened, but they kept putting up posters, which I think is an interesting strategy, saying, we want to be green, we'll do this. Whenever they did anything, they put up a sign saying, this is part of our great plan of making a more humane and more sustainable Sydney. Um, so here's one of these building walking, for, walking and bicycle network we do this to make the city more sustainable. Every time they did anything, they told this part of a bigger story. It's not to harass you who live there. Um, here, after many years, we, we managed to get the cars out of the main street of Sydney and managed to get a light rail on running the length of it. And it's been widened and expanded. 
and we just heard about it yesterday, and I hear they're, they're taking in another piece of, of, of a cart land and turned it into people land in Sydney. Sydney has been greatly changed. Also, the bicycles they worked on in, in Sydney, and here we start the first step of the Danish Copenhagen-style bicycle lanes in Sydney. And then I suddenly noticed that they have a Danish flag flying on that building in the background. And so why do you have the Danish flag flagging, f hanging there? Then there was a little plaque. If you will go close to the plaque, it say, in this little puny pub, the Danish crown prince Friedrich met his Australian crown princess Mary Newton 2000 in the Olympics. So that is really Copenhagen corner. And that's where they started. Now, the, this is the same corner a little bit later. And, oh yes, what happened when you do all this? Back? They make you honorary citizen yes, when you throw out these parked cars and put in bicycle lanes. And the crown princess was down there a little while ago to test all the bike lanes. That's what happens. Then I could tell about Copenhagen, but I told about that yet, yesterday. Copenhagen, we've done almost nothing. Uh, or I have done all, maybe that bridge down there. But, um, <laughs> and I had a great fight with Rock and Kohlhaas about the surroundings of this building, and we managed to have a bridge over, a, a big pedestrian uh, bicycle bridge over to the other side as part of the package which Real Dania paid for. Um, but ever since 1961, they have had a people first policy. They very early, they pedestrianized out the main street, and that was one of the first in the world. Everybody said it would never work, and it worked wonderfully. And that was the time when Jane Jacobs was writing about the problem in New York, in Copenhagen, the mayor was doing something about it. And that was so popular that he continued, and now, uh, 60, to, uh, some 60 years ago, now we've done a lot of things, and it's not only here, it's the whole city. They have this policy, we will be the best city for people in the world, and that is just about mindset. We have got this new mindset in Copenhagen, and this is, I showed you this the other day, that they, this policy of continuous sidewalk, continuous bicycle lanes, and that's wonderful generally in a city to give the right to the pedestrians, to the wheelchairs, and to the mothers with prayers, whatever. But the main thing is that my grandchildren can now walk all the way by themselves to school because all the sidewalks go from the door to the school. They haven't got to cross any streets no more. That's very important when you are six or seven, and that gives a much better city for everyone. Um, I could tell a lot about the bicycle policy in Copenhagen. They have by now a complete bicycle system, very good bicycle lanes all over the city. And we have seen some fantastic increase that the more, the better you make the infrastructure, the more people bicycle. We've seen some that now we are close to 50% uh, taking the bike when they go to work or to study in Copenhagen. And for Copenhagen, for Copenhagen, who was one of the first in the world to do all this, uh, we have known for years that if you put in more roads in a city, you have more traffic, because you invite people to have the bright idea, and I could also drive, let me drive. But what happens if you give good invitations for people activities, you will have more walking, more public life, and more bicycling. So there is a choice here. We have proved that it worked in Copenhagen. What happens if you do all these awful things to a city like Copenhagen, like taking out 2% of the park cars every year and all that? You see the Minister of Culture reading really good literature, but what is more important, she uses it to make a, a, a architecture policy saying put people first. What happens if you do all these awful things to a city? We have 420 delegations of mayors and city planners from all over the world coming to see, uh, and also we have 6,000 UIA members coming, by the way. That's what happens. What happens when you do all these awful things to a city? They choose 
the number one assistant I had all over all the years, Camilla van Ders, to be the city architect. So now I can sleep completely confident that the mindset will be carried on with, with great strength. What ha yeah, they even put my face on the, on the metro doors and on the bus stops in some price saying that you delivered the mindset for this change. That was very kind of them. That was, of course, very kind. But I think that the greatest moment in my professional life was yesterday when, after having criticized the architects for 62 years, they all stood up and applauded Rob Adams from Melbourne, Camilla van Ders from Copenhagen, and myself. That was very moving. Thank you very much. Um, we'll do it um, a bit shorter. We are very honored to have you uh, with us. Um, we appreciate your time. It has been a very busy week so far for you. And uh, right, there were so many people that um, are visiting the city, so many activities where you are participating. So we appreciate it. Um, I decided to make a light version a little bit funny because we've been at all these sessions in these days. We need good. some light stuff. I will um, do it also light with the interview. You say that um, it's important to change mindsets. Um, and one of the, the of the heroes that you had uh, was Ralph Eskin. Eskin correct? Yeah, uh, he said, to be a good architect, you have to love people. Um, I wonder how do you change mindsets or other mindsets in order to, for them to love people or to teach kind of empathy? How do you for others to develop that love for... Yeah. I don't know how many of you knew about or know about Ralph Erskine. He was a fantastic architect. He lived in the modernistic times, but all the time he was able to do fantastic schemes and work all the way down until you had an entrance door with a bench and a little, mm. a little screen. And it was so much... He also told me that make a good city at eye level and it doesn't matter what's further up because people don't see it anyway. So in that way, you can build a very cheap social housing. Just make sure that the ground floor is very rich. Then the whole area will be very rich. Things like that he showed all the time. He had a heart as big as, as um, that square, which is too big. Um, so he, he was a fantastic person. In the, uh, towards the end, we interviewed him for a television show, and he said, we asked, what does it take to make a good architect? And he just said, to make a good architect, you must love people because it's all about the environment, the, the surroundings or the environment where people live. So you must love people to make good environment. He was a fine person, a, a fantastic Read about him. That's a um, a good lesson to be to be passed to others. And I wonder, you said you have been criticized for so many years. And you know, you have criticized a lot for so many years. And actually, you had some uh, op uh, some forces that were not that were didn't agree with with you for many years as well. Uh, I wonder how do you deal with criticism when you have it now? Okay, we agree on put people first, but at the beginning, people were not, didn't agree with what you say. Completely correct. Because uh, in the beginning, it was very much a, a, a revolt against modernism, and everybody was sort of... Mm. Because modernism also was a lot, a great thing for the architects, because suddenly the objects were the main thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's difficult to make spaces, but it's easy to make an object. And then... You can start to compete with the other architects to making more funny objects, and that carried on and on. And very early on, I started to be very critical about that focus on objects and not focus also on the spaces for life and for people. And of course, that was a lot of criticism. And people, yeah, I had a bad time in university as a, as a researcher. They said, you are wasting your time. All this about life, that's not architecture. Forget about it. You will ruin your career. And how and did you deal with that when you were... No, I, I, I cried. Um, <laughs> and then, then 
Yeah, that's a special. Uh, uh, nobody can understand it, but we had a period of five years where everybody in in school worked said they had one vote, and that was the reason why all these very social, very harsh socialist students in Denmark, they came to school of architecture because they could get grant to study Marxism for five years. I was in one of those very harsh departments and I had once got um, forbidden to teach because it was dangerous because by telling about how to make better cities for people, you could delay the revolution. That was very serious. So. I went to Melbourne, I went to Edinburgh, I went to Toronto, I started to travel around and then I found out that in all these places there was an enormous interest for this humanistic approach. My wife, the psychologist, she has also done a lot of work, research work on housing and we gave lecture series and suddenly we found that we were great heroes and we were five, ten years in front of everybody in Denmark uh, at the end of the 60s and then I came home from these journeys and I knew a lot about the world and the other ones, they found out that they couldn't use Marx anyway. So um, that was a change. But there's been a great skepticism and there's always been groups of architects who are very happy about Dubai and very happy about making these objects and, uh, and um uh, concentrated on the buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's always been some schisma between me saying that I think my conclusion is that if you want to make a have residential area which is good for people, make sure that you use the same care for the outside as you use inside the apartment. Normally we put a lot of, of effort inside and then if there's some budget over, we do some slaps outside. But it's so important that it's very inviting. I told you that there could be a difference in 10 times more life in this area as opposed to this with the same population living these two places because it, it's very much a, ma a matter of invitation. That's what we found. That's good. Actually, I had to feel, think of a little bit of Anna Hellinger because of the uh, uh, opposite forces from the beginning, especially then after showing that it's, it's working, then you get more acceptation for, for the world. That might be something that Google uh, talk together. But Jan, we're very thankful for, for your time. I um, hope you appreciated that you had more time as well. Uh, and, and, <laughs> <laughs> and you can realize how moved I were to see yesterday all my colleagues, I which I've discussed ready. these things all the years that they thought that there was something in this mindset which could be useful for our human settlement. Actually, I, I brought my book to be signed by you. Oh, another book, another one. <laughs> so yeah, thank, thank you a lot. Welcome. Thank you a lot.